Thank you, Dr. Nagakati, for that very kind introduction. And you can judge very quickly whether you think I have a southern accent or an English accent. I've been told that I have both since I've been here in some frequency. <laughs> I tend to present myself as um, a hybrid in all sorts of ways, um, because I, I grew up here in South Carolina, very strong roots here. Um, when, when Dr. Nagarkati says I, I'm a Gamecock, uh, that goes several generations deep on both sides of the family, so um, yeah, this is um, really strongly where I am grounded, but then have, in many ways, very unexpectedly found a second home in Oxford. And very often people say, um, oh, that's you know, kind of an unusual journey. That's, that's interesting. You seem to have a lot of diverse interests. Interesting. Uh, but I don't ever really get the opportunity to talk about the how and the why of how that happened. And so I am deeply honored to be able to come and speak with you today. It's a privilege to be here at Carolina and to witness how much the university has grown in the time since I've been here. I have to say I'm going to be referring to some early formative experiences for me that helped um, me make some of my early decisions and moves um, towards what would become my quite diverse research trajectory. And at the time, those opportunities were very formative for me, but I'm looking back and thinking that actually some of those initiatives were very much in their early days. So it's really astounding for me to come and see the university now, to see how much it's grown, one side of campus I barely recognize, I mean, in terms of just the phenomenal amount of both the building growth and seeing, you know, all the investment that's been done in some of the, the major schools here, um, but also looking at the range of presentations in the program for Discover USC. It's really very humbling and very exciting. And as uh, I connect with Dr. Nagargati's comments about what was such a strong motivation for me in coming to USC in the first place was the fact that because it was a major research university and because I had such a diversity of interests, I felt this was a place where any of those interests could be met and cultivated. And so finding those resources, finding the people who encouraged me were so crucial on those early days of my journey. So it is a real privilege for me to be able to come here today think back on those early stages of, of the journey and how they connect to the more recent stages and to take part in such an inspirational event to see how the university continues to grow and really make a mark, um, both in research terms and also on the local community. Now, being invited to give a keynote at an event like this, um, on the one hand, I was deeply flattered but also more than a little terrified, especially when I, I looked up the event last year. I, I knew that it was a fairly recent initiative of the Office of the Vice President. And so I went to look at the program last year and I, I said, oh, the first keynote speaker was a Nobel Prize winning physicist who um, <laughs> invented blue and white LEDs, which I use in my house, and I think probably most people will be benefiting from his work. And you know, his story was very much one of of passionate pursuit of something that was new, that he was doing very well. I learned um, in a conversation at dinner last night that he was sort of an unexpected person to have achieved this because he was competing against uh, you know, people who were working in some of the, the big corporations who were also trying to, uh, to invent this technology. And yet he managed to do this through a lot of his own self-learning and determination. I thought, wow, what an amazing story. Um, and that's rather terrifying to follow that. <laughs> so what can I say to this audience? And I thought, well, what brings us all together as a community at this event is that we are all researchers. And we spend a lot of time in our various fields thinking about the methods of our research. And we can think about the topics of our research. So certainly when someone asks me, oh, you're a researcher, what do you do? I can say, well, I, I work in health services research. I think about long-term health conditions. I have some other interests um, in obesity. I'm starting a new study in dementia. So I can kind of spin off the topics and the setting. And then I say, I'm, I'm trained as an anthropologist. So I do a lot of qualitative work, drawing on either participant observation or in-depth interviews. But also, I come from a quantitative background. So not afraid of numbers. I like a chance every now and then to work with, with a numerical data set. So those are the easy answers You know, when someone asks me to talk about research. And I think that's reflecting, really, how we're trained, I think, as researchers. you know, We are trained to think about what fields do we come from? What are the core methods for those fields? We need to build up and demonstrate and expertise in those fields. So I think we're very good about talking about the how of our research and the topic of our research. 
but we don't often get a chance to step back and really think about the why of our research and the so what of our research. And so I hope that you'll indulge me and uh, let me walk you through some of um, my unexpected diversions and different choices that I made on parts of my journey. But where I'm hoping to take you with me on this, on this journey is to not so much think about any one individual personal journey of research, but to think about this as a collective journey, as a collective experience, because together we are producing a body of knowledge. We are asking the questions that's going to take us forward. What do we know? What do we need to know? What do we realize we don't know very well? How can we answer those questions? So I'd like to take you on a bit of my own journey, but really where I want to go is thinking about research as a collective exercise and thinking about what we are doing as a research community. So thinking back and getting this fantastic opportunity to reflect on my own journey, I thought, okay, what, what's gonna get me, get me talking about research as a journey? And I remembered a, a favorite poem that um, will be no doubt familiar to many of you, and I've returned to it again, so I thought I'd, I'd share it just to start thinking about, about journeys. Two roads diverged in a yellow wood, and sorry I could not travel both and be one traveler, long I stood and looked down one as far as I could to where it bent in the undergrowth. Then took the other as just as fair, and having perhaps the better claim, because it was grassy and wanted wear, though as for that, the passing there had worn them really about the same. And both that morning equally lay in, in leaves no step had trodden black. Oh, I kept the first for another day, yet knowing how way leads on to way, I doubted if I should ever come back. I shall be telling this with a sigh, somewhere ages and ages hence. Two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all of the difference. I'm sure many of you in the audience will recognize the words of the American poet Robert Frost um, in The Road Not Taken, which is one of his most well-known poems. I came across it originally in school. I think I had to memorize it at some point. And it was interesting that I stumbled on it again when thinking about how to characterize a journey and what it meant for me now, being at a different stage in that journey. I also hadn't appreciated uh, when I first encountered it as a child the context of that poem. So he published it in 1916, and that was after he himself had spent three years living with his family in England. And it's thought that the content of the, the poem was very much inspired by his many walks with his literary contemporary, Edward Thomas, walking in the woods. And it's a nice framing device for me to think about metaphorically walking in the woods and coming up to those junctures, those divergences in the path where you don't know where each one of them is going to lead. A lot of times you can only make a best guess as to um, what the outcome will be and if there is such a thing as the right choice. And that very much has reflected my path. I've come to one divergence after another. And so on the surface of it, it looks like I've come quite a long way from an undergraduate student here in chemical engineering to working in health services, mixed methods health services research within the UK's National Health Service. But I'm gonna to try to make those links now and show you the, the kind of opportunities that arose, often quite unexpectedly, that led me down that path. So my path has been one that's very much been characterized by multidisciplinary journeys. As I say, I think our early training as researchers is very much about learning how to do something in one field very well. We pick a major subject, maybe we do a minor subject, or some who are very well motivated might do additional major subjects, but we tend to get grounding in one particular field that usually comes with its own logic, its own methods, its own expectations for outputs. So here I was, a chemical engineering major, a dance minor, which everyone said, well, that's quite unusual, and that was reflecting um, two long-term interests of mine. I loved the math and science in school, but I danced from a very young age, and so coming to USC allowed me to continue both of those interests to a very uh, high standard and, and in-depth, but my experience here was very much doing those things in parallel. So really, I thought, well, my major subject is chemical engineering, so that's, my, uh, that's going to be my main focus, so I have to figure out what I'm going to do with that. And that, as a field, is one that opened a lot of opportunities, and so some of my, um, my classmates uh, have gone on to be chemical engineers, others have gone on to be doctors, 
architects. I think, as far as I know, I'm the anth only anthropologist, but it was a field that gave us a good, solid training um, in applied research and also great skills in quantitative analysis. So I assumed, after a few years um, within the chemical engineering program, that my next step would probably be to continue in that field. And this was where the first few fortuitous opportunities and divergences cropped up. So I was very fortunate at that time, um, pretty much by accident, I think through uh, word of mouth through a friend, um, to learn that a new assistant professor by the name of Dr. Michael Amaritis was happy to take undergraduate research students in his lab. And I thought, well, if I'm going to make a career out of chemical engineering, it's probably good to figure out what they do. Research experience probably sounds like a good idea. I wasn't sure at that point if I would want to go on to graduate study. So I thought that would be a good opportunity just to get some experience and um, get a feel for it. And he was very happy to uh, take on a keen and interested undergraduate student. And so he had a project that he was starting up. and. I didn't really know anything about the project, so I wasn't there kind of already with a research agenda, just there for the experience. So he put me on a project. Um, we were making materials called sol gels, and we were trying to characterize those with infrared spectroscopy. So there I was, 19 years old, my, my freshman summer, getting a lot of guidance both from Dr. Emeritus and also from the graduate students and the postdoctoral researchers who were in the lab, who were very supportive and you know, spent a lot of time making sure that I had all the support that I need both to learn the techniques of using the lab equipment and to get a feel for how to do the analysis. And you know, I didn't really think how, um, how unusual that was at the time, but looking back, I think those sorts of initiatives to really try to open up research, particularly to the undergraduate students, um, were quite new and took a lot of um, basically individual level investment. So I think Dr. Ramiridis had joined the university the year before as an assistant professor. He was building up his research group and was quite happy to extend the invitation to undergraduates to do research with him. So I spent two years, two summers, um, working on the characterization of the sol gel materials, um, not really thinking about what they might be used for. His graduate students were more interested in the applications, um, which were mainly around catalysis and looking at making chemical processes um, basically more um, friendly, <laughs> using less toxic materials. But I was just happy to get the experience and to have that opportunity to see what lab work was like from the inside. And then the next little fortuitous diversion came at the suggestion of Dr. Amaritis. After I'd spent those first couple of summers working for him, he said, well, I don't know if you're aware of it, but we here at USC have this program called the Research Experience for Undergraduates, where we get to bring in um, students from across the country, and they get to come in and work with us. Now, you've already worked here, so you've gained some experience with us. I wonder if you might be interested in looking at one of these programs that might send you somewhere else for the summer gain a you know, different experience, different environment, um, possibly working on different sorts of projects. So it was very much at his suggestion that I looked into this opportunity. And at the time, they were running another REU program at the University of Colorado in Boulder in chemical engineering. So I had this opportunity to go during my third summer to UC Boulder. And there, I think, um, coming into a new lab setting that wasn't my own university, seeing how other people did things, and also finding a project that really captured my research interest was a pretty crucial moment in thinking, yes, I think that was the moment where I thought, I'm pretty sure I do want to go on to graduate study. And I had the opportunity that summer to work with a group um, that was working with materials that had potential application in healing severe bone fractures. So these were materials that when you show UV light on them uh, were polymer materials that would reach incredible strengths, but they also had characteristics of being able to um, degrade in a controlled manner. So the idea was we can possibly use these to seal, heal uh, severe bone fractures while they're healing, but the research was about learning how to control that process so that as the materials were breaking down, it was at the same rate that the bones were growing back. And so for me, I thought, yes, you know, this really got me excited. I thought, I want to see that what I'm doing in the lab has a real knock-on effect in health. You know, this is going to improve people's lives. It's going to make it easier um, for people to recover from these severe fractures, because otherwise, the, the standard treatment at the time um, was usually the um, lots of metal pins um, being used to hold your bones together. So that was a moment, again, just at the suggestion of my mentor here, that I expand my horizons a bit, have a look at 
what other groups were doing and how things were run in other research environments. And that solidified my decision to go on to graduate school. So I came back to USC and thought, well, I'm going into my senior year. I'm pretty convinced I want to go to graduate school in chemical engineering. So I started thinking about where I might apply. And in the midst of that, I had another fortuitous intervention from the Office of Fellowships and Scholar Programs. Now, I had worked with them already um, in applying for a Goldwater fellowship uh, during my junior year. So I'd already kind of built up some working relationships with them, and they knew I had an interest in going on to graduate school. So I had a, just a little nudge from Novella Beskid, the director, and she said, I know you're interested in going to graduate school. Have you thought about going overseas? And I said, no, not at all. I don't speak any other languages. Um, I've got you know, a list of five programs that I think I've identified. No, I hadn't really. And she said, well, you might just want to look into it. Just a thought. I had, at that point, decided that I was going to take an extra semester because by this point, the minor program in dance had been introduced. It, it hadn't actually been formalized when I started at USC. And so by this point, I had the opportunity to, uh, to do a minor in dance and so decided to take an extra term to make sure that I could complete all the credits for the minor in dance as well as complete my chemical engineering major credits. And then that also gave me another opportunity, another summer, to work on my uh, thesis project. So I was back in the lab with Dr. Emeritus working on the thesis project project at that point. So I had a little time. Um, since I wasn't graduating in May, I had that summer just to give myself that moment to explore. And I had a look and I thought, well, I don't know anything about England. I don't know anything about Oxford particularly. So I spent some time just looking on the website and I just got curious. And so I, I came back to Novella when the term was starting up and I said, so this thing you mentioned about, about going to England. You know, how do I look into that? And I got a tremendous amount of support, both from the fellowships office and from a number of the faculty who served on committees that helped us to prepare. So all of this was a very much a collective effort. But this was an opportunity that I hadn't really seen coming less than a year before that. But it still fit overall with my ambitions in terms of, of graduate research. So I went through the process, and I think I was surprised as the next person who, uh, when they said, oh, yes, we've chosen you to be one of the ones to go to Oxford on a Rhodes Scholarship. And I called my parents, I called Novella, and I said, so it looks like I'm going to England. <laughs> I wasn't expecting that. I'd assumed that I would come home after a good experience, but probably unsuccessful interview, finish up my senior thesis, graduate, and go and put in those applications to the other five programs I'd been looking into. So all of a sudden, yeah, this was a very different opportunity. And I thought, well, I need to make the most of this. And my plan, the proposal that I put forward for the Rhodes Scholarship, was to take two years to spend in the organic chemistry laboratory there, because I'd gathered from my chemical engineering experience that because we were much more focused on the applications, we actually spent less time in the labs um, doing more of the, uh, the core synthetic work. So I thought, well, that will serve me in good stead. I'll spend two years in the chemistry laboratory. I'll come back probably with a bit more experience than you know, the typical entry chemi. Uh, PhD candidate has, so, so that could only be a good thing, and I will experience living somewhere else. Um, I didn't have a passport at the point that I went to England, so it was all very new for me. And people ask me, you know, what, what did you expect and how was the adjustment? And I think, frankly, I had very low expectations. I thought, well, it's dark and cold and rains a lot, and so I may not like it at all. <laughs> and I think that actually um, helped to make the adjustment. So when I got there, I could just explore it for what it was. And in many ways, I had a wonderful first year, um, connected with some fantastic people. It was a great community, both the Rhodes community, uh, the people within my college at Oxford, um, really stimulating environment. But there was one problem, and that was within the first week that I got to the chemistry laboratory, I realized that there was a bit of a mismatch between my research motivations and the research motivations of the lab there. So I had requested to work in a group um, that was working on synthesis of a, a material that had a health application, because that was the thing that had gotten me really excited in that summer in Colorado. So I had said, uh, yes, please put me in a group where I know that what I'm doing will, will have some relevance there. So I was put on a project to make a molecule that supposedly, um, if it worked, might have relevance for a new medication in diabetes. So my first question when I got there was, if I make the molecule, do I get to test it? Do I get to find out if it's actually useful and it, if it could feature in new medication? And my supervisor said, well, you've got to understand, we've been trying to make this for quite a few years now. 
you're going to pick up at the stage of the project where the last person left off. Um, we got to kind of a stuck point, so we're going to have to take it a few steps backwards. We'll be very, very impressed if you get further on than the last person did. And if you do actually manage to make any of it, we'll send it off to our colleagues in industry and they'll take it from there to test it. And I thought, oh. <laughs> um, so there was a real mismatch there with my motivations because for me it was all about you know, wanting to know that the research that I was doing was going to have an impact on people's lives in terms of improving their health. So I did spend that first year in the organic chemistry lab and um, learned a lot about how to make compounds. Did manage to get a step on with that, um, making that molecule, but I thought, you know, I can do this for another year, but it's not really speaking to my core motivations as a researcher. And so at that point, I had the opportunity, very, again, unexpectedly, uh, to pursue a new course in medical anthropology, which I'd only heard of about a year before that, because here I had not studied anthropology, so I had no training or background in it. Um, but I had this opportunity, and, I, and in speaking to some friends who had studied anthropology here at USC, they said, well, you know, if you're not sure what you want to do, but you know you want to, you know, to do something in health, this is a great place to be because you can ask the big questions. Anthropology is all about you know, anything to do with people. It's about you know, how do people across the world make sense of health and illness experiences? What drives the decisions that they make? How do they understand and, and cope with illness? So you know, if you want to do something in health but you're not sure what, that could be a great fit for you. So that began the transition into stage two, which was as the medical anthropologist. And I spent initially a one-year master's course, which I assumed would just be the one year. But I did fall in love with that subject. Having that opportunity to ask those big picture questions for the first time was scary. <laughs> it was not the way that I thought at all, but it also really changed the way that I thought. It changed my worldview. So when I had the opportunity to do a second year of the master's and do a more in-depth thesis, I was able to do that and focus on dance therapy. So it was the first time that I was able to bring those interests in science and dance together. And at the end of that, I had an opportunity to stay on and do a PhD again focusing on dance. So these were opportunities that I had not planned when I set foot on the plane to go to Oxford, but opportunities that presented themselves nonetheless. And so at the end of that, I finished my PhD in 2007, and I thought, okay, I've made this transition now as a medical anthropologist. Where do I go from here? And from there, I'll talk a little bit more in detail about the work that I've done since then in a moment, but from there, my first job as a postdoctoral researcher was in a multidisciplinary unit that was just being set up, um, that was trying to think about what were all the gaps in what we knew about obesity science and obesity interventions, because we'd been, you know, had 30 years of evidence at this point and lots of trials and interventions, and yet in the UK and elsewhere, we were still seeing obesity rates go up and up and up. So I joined that as a postdoctoral researcher and then continued my affiliation doing research with that unit um, for the next seven years, first as a researcher and then also as a lecturer in medical anthropology. So that took me to 2014 when I had this solid grounding both in my field as a medical anthropologist and now as part of a multidisciplinary team looking at obesity research. And this was another critical junction in the path. Um, at that point, I had, I had to make a decision. I had these diverse interests in dance and in health, and I thought, what's the core? What's going to take me to that next stage of my career? And I thought, it really was. What, what took me here in the first place was the interest in health applications. So now I've been doing these projects that are thinking about health trends on a very large scale, but I think now I'd like to actually focus down and work more on the ground and see you know, how can we improve health in the context that I'm working in, in the, within the UK context. So three years ago, a little over three years ago, I made a sideways shift into the Department of Population Health within the University of Oxford. And because I'd already been working as part of a unit that was a multidisciplinary unit, again, that drew on a real drive. I think uh, I like working in those collaborative uh, those collaborative units, and so I'm the only anthropologist on my team within the Health Services Research Unit, but this has given me a real opportunity in the last three years to focus on that on-the-ground applied health work. So quite uh, a different point now than where I started in Dr. Ramirez's lab in the late 1990s. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about, research-wise, what were some of the motivations and the choices that I made. 
Now, don't worry, you're not going to be quizzed on this, but this is a diagram that I, I used to use in my lectures for Introduction to Medical Anthropology. And this is just taking me back to my entry into medical anthropology. And as I said, this was an opportunity for me to start asking the big questions about health. So whereas before I'd been focused on the details of how to make something that might have a health application, here I was asking the big questions. Why do people get sick? How do they know they're sick? What do they do about it? How do they respond when they have a lot of choices about what they do? How do they, do, how do they know what's the right choice? So this allowed me to ask those big questions and then focus um, for my master's thesis on why my specific focus there was why was dance therapy on the rise in the UK at that time when the context was very much a, you know, a medical context. So an arts, a creative arts therapy didn't seem like something that should be doing well there, but it was at the time. So I was able to ask those big picture questions about, you know, what, what space is dance therapy occupying in the whole health landscape within the UK. When I moved to my PhD work, at that point, I was getting a bit more grounded in dance itself as a social and cultural practice. Now, at this time, I had the decision to make when I was applying for the PhD in anthropology. I had an NSF fellowship, which at the time could be used for overseas studies. And so I had to reapply. I'd applied for a chemical engineering program, but I had to reapply for an anthropology program. So I rewrote the proposal. and. At the time, what I proposed was to do a comparative analysis, looking at different movement forms and trying to ground those in their historical context and say, you know, what does the movement that we see mean and where did that come from? Uh, so very much a, a more of a social anthropology project. But the PhD, um, as in terms of its own internal diversions, um, did not shape up that way at all. Uh, I spent my PhD field work working at a school for professional dance in London, and I thought initially, well, if I want to go and find out about what dance means, I should just go and spend a lot of time with dancers. So I was part of a daily training program, very much participant observation, participant experience even. And I realized very quickly that the research questions that I had put into my proposal couldn't be answered by the setting that I was in. I thought, actually, we're not talking about meaning and choreography. This is very much about how people are socialized into this profession. So what I'm really looking at is how are people's bodies transformed? How do they make that transition from aspiring dance students to professional? What are they like at the end of this process? And how are they recognized by others in their professional community as dancers? So the nice thing about that, in realizing that my original research question really was not going to be answered, and that was a tough period, I think in the walk in the woods metaphor, that was when the trees were closing in and I really wasn't sure where I was. I felt very lost and didn't know where I was going. But at the same time, um, in conversation with my supervisor, she had said, well, there's some interesting material actually coming out of medical anthropology around sensory experience and body practice. And that's being applied to therapeutics. So it's things like, you know, why do people find that it's more effective to have a medicine that induces sweating and a severe nosebleed? And people are talking about um, how to mobilize sensory experience towards healing. So it's coming from that literature. But it seems like this would be something that would be very relevant um, to try and explain the sort of body transformations that your dancers are going through. So that was a nice way to, um, to focus on the dance, but also draw on knowledge that was coming out of medical anthropology, this very diverse field that had an explicit health focus. So I get to the end of the PhD, and I thought, well, what have I learned from that? Um, I've learned that bodily practice is this kind of tension between repetition and habit, and for the dancers, you know, being in the studio day in and day out, but it's also this tension with people who are acting as their own agents, making choices. In the dancers' cases, um, you know, that was creative choices, artistic choices. But I thought, surely that way of thinking has to apply to health as well, because every day we're doing our, we do what we do in some ways out of habit and practice, but when we think about whether or not a health intervention works, maybe we need to think about that tension between what people habitually do and then what they want to do and what they choose to do and why certain health interventions that ask people to change their behavior might work or not work. So that's where I was coming out of my PhD, and I thought, right, I'd like to focus more explicitly on health now and apply what I've learned from the PhD. So at that time, I uh, met up with a former teacher of mine in medical anthropology, 
And I said, this is what I've learned from my PhD. I'm just coming out of it. I'm unemployed, very much like a job. <laughs> and um, do you have any you know, directions you can point me in? And he said, well, as it happened, I've just gotten some funding to set up this new research unit. It's going to be a multidisciplinary unit in obesity. If you've got some time, I'm running some seminars. Uh, we're inviting people from all different fields to come and give a presentation on their research on obesity from their particular field. If you'd, if you'd be interested, come and come along, have, have a sit-in. So I, so I came along and I said, yes, you know, this is really interesting because on the one hand, I'm hearing about some people thinking about obesity from an economic history point of view, you know, looking at the trends over the long term and looking at maybe what was happening in terms of employment that might have affected the change in body size. And then I had other, somebody else who was looking at um, more of the, the business analysis of how chocolate was being produced in Ghana and how that was influencing consumption patterns there. And I thought, yeah, there seems to be a lot of, of work here where you can take uh, quite a few views on this. And I thought, surely this perspective now that I have on this embodied practice will be useful thinking about evaluating, say, interventions. So that's the work that I thought I was going to do. Um, and I applied for the job, got the job. So this was my first postdoctoral position. And I, we did pursue that. We, most of that year was brainstorming a lot of project ideas and just trying to get more substantial projects funded. So we talked a lot about the embodied practice and we had collaborations with artists thinking could we do you know, practice-based art, uh, art-based interventions. Unfortunately, most of those did not get funded. <laughs> and so what I ended up focused, <laughs> focusing on um, started with a very strange engagement. Um, so while we were brainstorming these ideas around embodied practice, my mentor said, well, I also want you to have a look at this. I said, what is that? <laughs> and uh, he said, well, I think you need to, to, uh, we need to understand this. And I said, well, what is that? <laughs> he said, yeah, some people have called it rhinoceros guts. Um, what it actually is, is a conceptual map. So at the time that I started my postdoc position, um, the UK think tank, Foresight, which was a, a government-funded think tank, um, their job was basically to think about some of the big challenges of the day. So they would do um, uh, projects on climate change um, and on ecosystems and on health aspects. And so they'd just finished running a two-year project called Tackling Obesities. And basically the, the remit was, you know, we've had 30 years worth of research and interventions, and yet we've done very little to kind of curb the tide. Obesity rates are still rising, so we really need to get everybody together and figure out, you know, what's going on? What do, what do we know about this? So this crazy map was one of the outputs of that think tank project, which basically involved convening about 200 experts across the UK for two years to try and get to grips with, you know, what is the state of knowledge in this field? So they were looking at it from all different perspectives. And this map was trying to connect all of the different factors that at the time that research suggested were important for contributing to obesity at the population level. It is a little bit more organized than it looks. <laughs> I've given you the messiest version of the map, uh, partly for emphasis. Um, but there are actually sections of the map. So the kind of blues down near the bottom are looking at things like physiology, genetic, epigenetic, um, predisposing risk factors to obesity. And then the, the zone in the green um, over towards the left is looking at food and food systems. So there's the individual level, the kind of food choices, food behaviors, but also the wider system. So how expensive it is to buy fresh vegetables in relation to um, oily foods and lots of chocolate. And then on the other side is looking at physical activity, both at an ind individual level and also the environment. And the top was kind of everything else, and everything else was, was my zone. Um, it, was the, it was called the psychosocial area. So it was looking at things like um, changing employment patterns, um, social attitudes, educational patterns, um, you know, all of those harder to define cultural aspects that might be contributing to obesity. So we spent a lot of time looking at this map. And the project that I ultimately worked on in relation to this map was actually trying to take a larger scale data set. Um, so we had some large scale cohort studies that had followed people from the UK born at a certain time and had followed them all the way through their lives. So we had an incredibly rich data set with their birth weight data, early health data, school data, then on to their you know, marriage, children, their employment patterns. And I worked with a data set that had followed people by this point up to their early 40s. And we thought, well, we've got this great data set that should tell us something. How can we use this crazy map to ask the right questions of these data? 
And so the work that came out of that was actually looking at um, the idea of risk across the life course and looking at risk from multiple angles. So we developed this model that was looking at taking account of early life risk. So for instance, if you had been born with a low birth weight suggesting you might have had some malnourishment um, in the womb, that could predispose you to uh, later risk for obesity and associated health conditions. But then we also wanted to take account of things like the food system and activity levels. So we used this map to identify factors within it that we could test within this, this longitudinal data set. And the, what we published out of that work was basically making the argument that you can't just think about risk in one way. We've got loads and loads of studies um, that tell us that this might be associated with obesity and that might be associated with obesity. But actually, this idea of risk is happening in this messy system, this very complex system where things are interrelated and there are feedback loops. So we developed this model to say, you know, you, you will get better predictions for who might be at risk for future obesity if you take account of multiple components of this system. So pretty far away again from the embodied practice, thinking about the on-the-ground uh, daily practice approach that we were still exploring in other projects, um, but quite different from this piece of work that I developed alongside my mentor there. So that was great to be able to kind of use the numerical skills again and also to, um, to be thinking about those longer term trends over time and trying to, to get to grips with how health conditions emerge in these very complex systems. But at that point, this was the point where I was um, getting ready to make that sideways shift to population health and I thought, now I've got the complexity thinking as part of my toolkit. Let me focus on a, a particular system, um, and that's the UK, and let's look at the National Health Service, which is its own complex system. So the work that I started three years ago um, took me very specifically into that landscape, and so, from, so what I had to learn from there was actually starting to connect the research agenda with the policy agenda. So this was the context in, into which I entered this work. Uh, the diagram there is, the, is a representation of the NHS outcomes framework, and basically what that was saying is that the policymakers had said for years and years and years we've been collecting all this evidence on whether people are satisfied with their care, um, you know, if they feel that they've built good relationships, you know, basically if they, if they like the service that they've gotten. But actually, we need to understand if those services, whether they like them or not, are actually having a real impact on their health conditions. So we need to move the shift from the, the process measures to the outcome measures. So they introduced this framework, and right there in the, whoops, right there in the middle, in, in domain two, um, a priority area had been identified about increasing quality of life for people living with long-term conditions. And that was really coming from the realization that our health system was not very well designed to support people with long-term conditions. The system had very much been set up to deal with single diseases that could be cured. And so you would go, get whatever treatment you needed, hopefully go away happy and cured. And with the demographic and population shifts and epidemiological shifts, the government and pretty much every researcher was saying, you know, we know our health system is not really up to scratch. You know, people are going to be living with these conditions. They're not going to walk away cured. So are we providing services that are helping them to live the best quality of life possible? So, and we need a way of measuring that and capturing that. So that was the, the policy context. And then at the same time, um, one of the main think tanks in the UK, the King's Fund had said, well, we also need to think about you know, people who are going to be engaged with the health services on a long-term basis. We need to think more about partnership models of care. We need to think about collaboration and shared care planning because we don't have a good sense of all the different things, particularly people who are living with multiple long-term conditions, all of the different things that they're having to manage and live with. So we need to have something that is much more about a conversation between patients and all of the different people who provide them care, instead of the model that we have now, which is usually kind of one conversation around one condition with one health professional, and, and then it's all a very disconnected system. So our kind of overall research question there was, how can we make this a reality? This is the policy objective to be collecting outcomes on quality of life and to encourage this shared partnership model, how can we do that? So the specific work that I came in to do was joining a team that was developing a new outcome measure. 
which is a fancy way of saying a health questionnaire, but what was specific about this measure is that we were not trying to ask about the things that the doctor could ask about. So we weren't asking about symptoms. We weren't asking about how many medications someone was taking. That information was all there. In terms of quality of life, we wanted to know, well, what are the things that really matter to you? You know, when you think about the impact that your health has on your life, what are the things that really make a difference? You know, what are the, what are the burdens? What are the things that you love to do and you want to make sure that you're still able to do those? So that work was about developing this new questionnaire to try and capture what was most important to people who are going to be living with long-term conditions. And that work was based on in-depth interviews with um, patients in the NHS who had a range of health conditions. Many of them had several health conditions. So this chart is a kind of snapshot of the, uh, some of the main ideas and concepts that came out of those interviews. And this was the basis for the questions that we then formulated for this health questionnaire which we went on to test. We uh, distributed it to a sample of, of about 1,200 people in the UK, some of whom also use the social care services, to test to see, are we asking the right questions? Uh, do the answers tell us anything? So if someone scores lower on this, would this be someone that might need some additional support that maybe needs to be referred somewhere else in the services? So that was the main focus of the project was on uh, generating the content around these themes and then developing the questionnaire, testing it, and where that work has taken me now is now looking at, we have this health questionnaire, now is it in use to people in the health services? So at the moment I'm focused on a couple of projects um, looking at whether or not this questionnaire would be useful, for instance, in memory clinics when people come in to be assessed for memory problems. And this came out of a partnership with our clinical partners who said, these are the sort of questions we're not asking our patients, and we think we should be. So perhaps we should be you know, asking them these questions when they come in for their first assessment, and then a few months later um, to see if our, if our intervention is making any difference. And as part of that, we've also developed a, a family carers version, because they said you know, th their quality of life is, is a big part of this as well, and, and we're concerned to make sure that our services are supporting them. So that's, if you like, on paper, the main work that I do now. I'm thinking about, can tools like this be used to structure conversations around shared care planning? Can they make it easier for someone with quite complex health needs to navigate a system that is, at the moment, still very fragmented? Most of the services aren't really connected. They don't tend to share information. So the burden very much is on the patients to kind of tell their story again and again as they move through the system. So that's mainly where I'm at. But also in doing this work, um, again, bringing in that background as an anthropologist, I looked at the interview data and I said, I, th I think there's something more to this story. I think there's something more we could do here. And so as a kind of an additional analysis of those interview data, I went back in and, and looked and was able to highlight different experiences of care that different people we had interviewed had talked about with us. And the example that I gave here were, were almost extreme counterexamples. But the point that I wanted to make with this was that these were people who were telling us their experiences of, of trying to get the health services that they needed. Now, in theory, we have a national health service, um, and the ethos of that is high quality, safe care um, at the point of delivery, irrespective of ability to pay. So the services are there. In theory, they are equally accessible to everyone. But we found in this interview study that people had quite different experiences in terms of how easily they felt they could access the services, what their experiences were within them. So a second analysis of, of that interview set has now led me thinking and trying to bring in more of the sociological theory about you know, what can explain those inequalities in how well people are able to access their services to support themselves and, and look after themselves better. So this is a, a kind of in development um, strand of my work. Now, I've taken you on that long walk in the woods with me, and thank you for bearing with me up to that point. Um, something I want to highlight from that walk is that I was not walking that path alone. I hope you picked up the number of times that you know, the opportunities arose because a mentor suggested them, or a new opportunity came because there was a new policy objective, and so we had this funding to develop this new questionnaire. So this is not a solitary journey. This has been my personal journey, but it's been a journey alongside and with um, many colleagues, peers, mentors, and friends. And so that brings me to alternative facts. 
Good, glad to see people were still awake <laughs> with that one. <laughs> Um, now, why am, I, why am I putting up a slide on alternative facts? Um, when I was asked what I would be focusing on for this keynote address, I said, you know, well, one thing in looking back on my own journey is thinking about just the importance, that basic importance of continuing to ask questions. And it may be that your journeys, you know, that you have one question that is going to take at least 30 years to answer, and so you just keep asking that question in a different way, and you go about it. And maybe the result of that is that you develop the blue LED light. I don't know. Um, equally, my path has been more about asking one question, learning from that. Perhaps a related question takes me in another direction, learning from that. Um, and so my path has been uh, very much about moving from one, you know, one area when I've learned something to ask the next question. But as a researcher, I'm always grounded in you know, trying to put all that together and think, well, what are we doing as researchers here? We're trying to accumulate a body of knowledge together. All of these different pieces that I'm doing, we're trying to you know, put together so that we as a society know more than we did before we asked these questions. And so when alternative facts came up as a, as a debate um, in the media last year, I thought, well, as a researcher, I find that really disturbing because my, my impression of the debate was that people were saying you could just make a statement and um, it wouldn't necessarily be subject to challenge. And I thought, well, that, that doesn't sit well with me. And so, you know, as a researcher, I want to say it's really important that as a community, we keep asking these questions. We challenge each other. We ask each other to hold ourselves to account. And those can be things like, within the research community, you know, making sure that we try to minimize publication bias so that we don't just publish the studies where we found a good result, but we're actually honest and say, you know, we thought this was going to work and actually it didn't, but we need to publish that so that uh, people know it didn't work. And so I thought, you know, that's a core of a research identity is, is really trying to make sure that we are building together this body of knowledge, but that it's always open to, to challenge. And so the, the idea of the, the alternative facts disturbed me, but then when I looked back on it, I thought, well, actually, it was sort of reassuring in the response because you did actually see that collective response. So all of a sudden, you know, people saying, well, I'm not sure if that, that statement was right. And so then you have people from other corners saying, well, the National Park Service has some video data. Let's look at that. We have transport data. Let's put all that together. And so looking back on it, I thought, actually, um, it's, it's a kind of nice example of cumulatively people trying to come together and, um, you know, really collectively question things and produce the knowledge around whatever this debate may be um, together. And so I thought that's, that's something I'd like to really leave you with, is that these journeys are not personal individual journeys. They really are about how your work fits into a collective journey where we are constantly still challenging each other to find out what we know and what we don't know. So this is not, you know, it is, it's very much the, the group's journey rather than just a personal journey. And I was, I can credit my PhD student with this. Uh, but I was trying to think how can I visually represent that collective journey and, and talking with her during her PhD work, um, she was really into this idea of fractals. Now, this is an anthropology student. I said, fractals, excuse me? She said, yes, I think it's all about fractal, <laughs> fractals. I said, what, explain to me. And she said, well, it's this idea that, um, now she was trying to explain something else, but she said, it's this idea that the pieces within this pattern are similar to each other. They have the same symmetry, and you, you reproduce them, but they, they go on a spiral, or they turn corners, or if you zoom in to something like a snowflake, you see the same pattern on the micro level as you do when you look at the whole snowflake. And so I thought, well, I'll, I'll finally do some credit and use the, all this discussion about fractals that we did. So I was thinking about that in terms of uh, as a research community. So the individual bit that you do might be one tiny bit of that aloe vera plant. But as researchers, we need to be aware of how we sit with the next piece of the plant. And then perhaps when our, within our field, how that speaks to a related field, asking similar questions, but perhaps from a different angle. So I thought it was a nice metaphor for thinking about how what we do on our personal research journeys fits into something bigger as part of this collective journey towards generating knowledge. And I think the things that drive that are really the curiosity, and so that's, that's what you bring to it. It's your research questions. And then the context. 
things like the opportunities, the discussions with mentors, peers, funding opportunities, um, things that will allow you to pursue those questions, and then the commitment to do so, you know, you making that commitment to do the undergraduate thesis or to pursue a PhD or to go for that grant proposal. So I think those three things, the curiosity, the context, the commitment, are really driving that cycle of knowledge generation as a collective project. I'll close with coming back to, I think, the biggest question of all, which I said at the beginning, that we don't often pause to ask ourselves, which is, uh, why do we do this at all? The so what, the why of the research, we can say what we do, we can say what our methods are and what our topics are and what we conclude and what we learn, but overall, why are we doing this? Um, why has this university supported so much investment in growth into research across so many different fields? And in trying to, uh, to come up with an answer to that, I looked back to um, someone who was an influential figure again when I was here at USC, and that was Dr. Peter Cedarberg, who was then Dean of the Honors College. I came across recently an article that he wrote um, close to the end of his tenure, and he was talking about the research initiatives that they had taken, specifically within the Honors College, but he was setting that within the research initiatives that had been taken more broadly within USC. And he talked about you know, all the programs where they were really trying to get particularly undergraduate students involved directly in research. But he was saying, we can't think of research as the kind of end goal in itself. Just doing research doesn't really ask, you know, it doesn't answer that so what question of why are we doing it. And he said, you know, the end goal is learning. And the research has to be working in concert with the teaching, with the administration. If it's not about learning, then why are we here? It's not, research is not just about a job. It's not about um, answering one question and then putting it on the shelf and, and doing nothing else with it. It really is about, you know, what are we learning? How do we take that forward? Who else is going to pick up that knowledge? What could they use it for? And so he was really inviting us to be part of that community of researchers that was also engaged in that higher goal, both through research and teaching and administration of learning um, within the university setting. And I liked his, his close to that article, which was, my vision of a community of liberal learning is therefore self-challenging. By definition, it must be open to critique and change. I do not expect those who consider my argument to experience conversion upon reading the statement, but I hope they will be intrigued enough to join the journey. And so I hope that you will be intrigued enough to continue on your own journeys and think about the questions, the diversions, the unseen paths, um, perhaps the periods of very clear focus in your journeys but I hope that being here at this event has inspired you and gives you a chance to reflect both on the journey that you've made at this point, but also how your journey fits into this wider journey of us as researchers and us as a scholarly community. So again, thank you very much for me, for giving me the opportunity to be part of your journey today. It is such a privilege and I'm so proud to see the amazing strides that this university continues to take and I, I thank you for letting me be a part of it today.